Ooh. I've got a new computer. Hello, everybody. Hello. We're going to take a few minutes to let people get settled. <clears throat> See if I'm putting this on Facebook. If you haven't been in Zoom before, they're going to find um, there's a chat feature and there's a Q&A feature. You, if you use the chat, if you have some technical problems, we'll try to help you out. You won't be able to see yourself. Okay. And we'll have questions at the end for Caitlin. You can put those in the Q&A section. Okay, Facebook's just not going to work tonight. <laughs> we'll give everyone a few more minutes. <clears throat> So somebody has a question about how to mute yourself. You do not need to mute yourself. We, you're not going to be able to hear anything as yourself. <clears throat> you're just going to hear me and Tom and Caitlin. And we won't see you either. So you will just see one of us in the screen. And if it looks different, it's because this is a webinar rather than a meeting. So if that makes a difference. All right, we'll give everybody another minute and we'll get started. Everyone's probably going to have questions about their gardens and things are going on right now. You know, my, everything's growing like crazy with all this rain and heat. <laughs> Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. I am, we'll let people filter in. My name is Jill Vanning. I work for the Kimberly Library, and I'm also a Master Gardener. And I am here with Tom Wenzel, who is a member of the Amy County Master Gardeners Association. And he is the brains behind this program that brings you gardening topics twice a month. Um, Tom, do you want to talk about tonight's program? Okay, well, tonight we're talking about uh, diseases in, in vegetables. And this was a topic that was suggested by one of our uh, loyal attendees. So if you have an interest in a specific topic and we're setting up programming for next year, let me know and we'll work on it. And you can contact me through Gardner S O S at outagamey.org. So, and we'll mention that later in the day, uh, later in the program. Um, Caitlin was in the Master Gardener program, I believe, in nine, uh, 2017, 16. And she's been a horticulturalist at the extension for 2017. And when I get questions on uh, through the Gardner SOS email site, 
I can answer a lot of them through what I know and what other master gardeners know, but when it comes to plant diseases, I go straight to Caitlin um, because she's very knowledgeable. And the one thing I like about what she includes in her answers is information, not just, okay, this is what you got. And it's a little background. I appreciate it because she's educating us along with uh, just answering the questions. So I, I'm gonna stop talking now and I'll turn it over to uh, Caitlin. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Caitlin Bricko and I'm the horticulture educator for Extension Outagamie County. I'm also the advisor to the Outagamie County Master Gardener Program, which is how I got this invitation to speak tonight. So thank you guys. A little bit about me. I have a Bachelor of Science in Horticulture from UW-River Falls. I worked in the landscape industry for about six years before transferring to Extension where I've been for a little over four years now. When I'm not at the Extension office, I enjoy working on our small beef farm, camping, being out in my garden, or just curling up with a good book. Just a little bit of housekeeping information. I will be taking time for questions periodically throughout the presentation. So please put your questions in the chat box or the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. The Q&A is preferred, but we know that Zoom's a little technical and it might not always be the easiest to plop them in there. So we'll be monitoring both during the presentation. Also on most of the slides, I have publications listed that provide a little bit more information on each disease. Um, this is through the learning store through UW-Madison. These are available online for free, so be sure to write down the numbers if you'd like to discover more info on each disease. Uh, I will be turning off my camera during the presentation. Um, just to save on bandwidth, I live in Tigerton, so <laughs> the connectivity isn't always the greatest up here in the Northwoods, but uh, you will see my smiling face again at the end to wrap things up. So just going to turn off my camera and then we will get started. So on to diseases in the veggie garden. Okay, we're going to start off with one of the most popular diseases that can cause a major impact on the Wisconsin economy, late blight. The hosts of this disease are potatoes and tomatoes, and it's caused by the fungal pathogen Phytophthora infestans. Since potatoes are one of Wisconsin's top crops, it's key to identify this disease as early as possible in the state to prevent spread to our commercial fields. Fun fact or not so fun fact, this is the same disease that caused the Irish potato famine. So if you are of Irish descent, you may have this to thank for getting to America. Late blight is a destructive disease of tomatoes and potatoes that can kill mature plants and make tomato fruits and potato tubers inedible. Initially, affected areas look like water-soaked or oil-soaked spots on the leaves, as you can see in the bottom photo. Stems will develop dark brown to black areas. Tomato fruits with late blight also develop large sunken golden to chocolate brown firm spots with distinct rings and a leather-like texture. These may become sunken, um, or almost watery, um, and they do not smell the best. That's a very characteristic trademark of this disease. Potato tubers will get a reddish brown discoloration under the skin if you peel them, and they will also have that distinct smell. Um, you'll know what it is if you just have smelled like a rotten potato in a bag. Um, same thing. It just, it's putrid. <laughs> um, this disease leads to a really rapid plant death 
In fact, if conditions are right, which is cool and wet, um, entire plants can collapse and die from late blight in about seven to 10 days. Plants with late blight cannot be saved. They must be disposed of properly um, to avoid spread to other plants and other areas in the state. Like we mentioned, it's really important to catch this disease early. If it does appear in your garden, all the plants that are affected need to be removed completely. This includes roots and all. Bag up all plant material in a garbage bag and throw it out. Leave it for a trash pickup. Um, you really just want it out of the area. Don't try and compost it. It can overwinter in compost piles and the compost piles don't tend to get hot enough to actually kill the pathogen. Thankfully, this fungus can't overwinter in Wisconsin soils, um, but it can overwinter on plant debris. So again, be sure to completely dispose of all impacted plants. On a side note, if there are any healthy looking plants from a late blight affected tomato, they are safe to eat or preserve. So you can salvage a little bit of your crop if it hits late enough. Once tomato fruits begin to show symptoms, though they should not be eaten nor canned or preserved. Um, I'm a big canner myself and I had like go through one year and I was devastated, <laughs> but it happens. If you do suspect late blight, or even if you just have something going on with your tomatoes that you aren't certain about, you think it could be late blight, you can send it down to the Plant Disease Diagnostic Clinic or the PDDC. You'll hear me reference them throughout the presentation through UW Madison. They are really, really committed to catching this early in the state and they'll perform free testing to ensure that. Their contact information will be listed at the end of the presentation. Next, we move on to early blight. Early blight usually pops up ironically late in the season. This is a fungal disease caused by the septoria and alternaria pathogens, and they become active in wet and humid weather. Symptoms of early blight first appear at the base of affected plants. Um, you'll see they're roughly circular brown spots that appear on leaves and stems. You can see examples of that in the photos on the slide. They will start to enlarge um, and they'll get almost a target-like appearance on them because the middle on those areas starts to die out, like you can see in the bottom picture. And then they have a yellow haloing around them. This is pretty characteristic of early blight. Eventually these spots will kind of merge together and kill off the leaf or cause tissue death in the stem. Um, like I said before, it usually starts at the base of the plant and works its way up. This disease also usually causes plant death and it's very difficult to control. Dense foliage and high humidity can contribute to the development of this disease. Once signs appear, it's just really hard to manage. Some control can be achieved by removing infected leaves and plants as soon as you spot it. Don't wait another day, don't wait another hour. Get those plants out of there. Um, another option, you can apply fungicides with the active ingredient of either copper or chlorophalonil as a preventative, or as soon as you start seeing infection on other plants, um, you would remove those plants and then treat your other ones just as a preventative to keep them from spreading. Um, these fungicides can be found at most nurseries, garden centers, big box stores. In general, thinning of plants or removal of the branches can increase the airflow between the plants um, and it reduces that wet, cool time in the garden. If you do get this early blight in the garden, destroy all the plants by burning them or burying them or throwing them out such as with late blight. Up next is blossom end rot. This is a really, really common one. 
You've probably seen it in your garden um, or maybe your neighbor's garden. This is one of the number one issues I get contacted about during the season. I'm sure Tom would agree um, with Gardener SOS. Blossom end rot isn't actually like a fungal or bacterial disease. It's a physiological disorder of vegetables where the blossom end of the fruit, which is opposite of the stem, breaks down and rots. It most, is most common on tomatoes and peppers. You do see it in squash or other cucurbits occasionally. Um, what happens is initially kind of water soaked looking spots appear. They almost look like small bruises. And it's usually, like I said, on that blossom end of the fruit. On peppers, sometimes these spots can resemble sunscald and can form on the sides of the fruit near the blossom end. Eventually those spots enlarge becoming dark brown to black, sunken and kind of leathery. Half the fruit usually up to half the fruit is affected. Sometimes if you don't know you have it, which can happen, um, you'll cut into like a summer squash and the outside will look fine, but the inside will be all discolored and shrunken brown, just won't look right. So what causes this is a lack of calcium in the fruit. This can be due to lack of calcium levels in the soil, but more often than not, especially in our clay in most of Otagamie County, there's plenty of calcium there, but it's not available for uptake. Um, things that can cause this are drought stress, alternating soil moisture extremes. So we had this big droughty period now, and now we're getting six inches of rain. Um, so we may see a little bit more blossom end rot this year. Um, also, if there's damage to your root area that can inhibit calcium uptake as well as cold soils. So what can you do to control it? Um, try and avoid too much or too little water. We know that mother nature isn't always the greatest at helping us out with that, but if you can irrigate evenly and you can mulch around those plants to help try and retain some water during the dry periods, Avoid cultivation near plants that might damage roots. If this is a chronic problem for you, you can have your soil tested to determine if there's enough calcium in the soil. If not, adding calcium such as lime, bone meal, or eggshells is a really easy way to combat this disease. Okay, up next we have anthracnose. This is a fungal disease caused by a few different species um, of fungus. This most commonly affects cucurbits, so cucumbers, pumpkins, squash, um, legumes such as peas and beans, peppers, sweet corn, and tomatoes. Frequent showers um, and just being really humid, which in Wisconsin we have really high humidity for most of the summer. Um, that humidity plus with temperatures between around 70, 85 degrees um, and overcrowding of plants can favor the spread and development of this disease. Symptoms usually begin as small, pale yellow or water soaked spots as you can kind of see in the cucumbers on the bottom or even on the tomatoes. Um, you've Again, probably seen that in your garden, didn't think anything of it. I know I have myself. Um, if you leave them, they will rapidly enlarge and turn tan to brown, irregular in shape and black like you see on the pepper. As it progresses, it may move into stem and leaf tissue. Um, defoliation may come from that leaf tissue dying off and the fruit will turn black, shrivel, and die. This is most commonly developed on overripe fruit. 
So one really simple way to combat this is to pick your fruit right, right when it's getting ripe, not leaving it out there an extra day or two. Uh, management includes crop rotation. So rotating your plant families around the garden. I will touch on that in the end of the presentation. There are varieties that are resistant to anthracnose. So when you are picking out your vegetables, you will see a small A after the varietal name. That means it's anthracnose resistant. You can also help prevent this by doing good fall cleanup, such as um, you'll wanna remove all the plant debris from out of your garden, just so it doesn't overwinter. You can use fungicides, look for ones that contain neem oil, sulfur, or copper. And again, when choosing a fungicide, you're gonna to wanna to look and make sure that it can be used, that formulation can be used on vegetables in the garden. Okay, let's take a look at the questions. Um, okay, um, question in the chat box. I don't see many bees and I'm worried my tomato plants are not being pollinated. What can I do? As for boosting pollination in your garden, um, you can plant pollinator friendly flowers or plants around slash in your garden. I know personally, I took a small section of my vegetable garden and made it into a cutting garden. This has one boost of my pollination in my garden and two, I get to enjoy cutting fresh, beautiful flowers out of my garden all summer long. <laughs> I definitely wouldn't argue with that. Um, otherwise, just in general, being pollinator friendly, avoiding pesticide usage, um, and just trying to create a real haven for those pollinators around your garden. If I could interject here, um, honeybees are not the only pollinator. And actually, they're kind of a minor pollinator. So even though you're not seeing honeybees, there are probably a lot of native pollinators that are active. That's right, Tom. Other pollinators include um, a lot of beetles are pollinators. They may not be on a traditional list of pollinators, but they are one of the largest categories of insects that do pollinate along with flies and a, a lot of other insects. Okay, I think that's the only question. Uh, so we will move on. So we're going to start back off with a really popular one. This is powdery mildew. This disease not only pops up in the vegetable garden, but also appears in your ornamental garden as well. You may have seen it on Monarda or Flax before, as well as, again, in your vegetable garden. This is actually a really interesting disease, I think, personally, um, just because in the fact it won't spread from plant to plant. So let's say you get powdery mildew on your roses, it won't spread to your tomatoes. That's an entirely different species of powdery mildew fungi that's affecting your roses versus your tomatoes. Each one is unique and unable to infect the other. So it gives us some assurance in controlling it. Um, I, I just think it's really cool. <laughs> I'm gonna be a little bit of a plant geek there for a minute, but this fungal disease has a distinctly trademark look, like somebody almost snuck in your garden and sprinkled powder sugar or baking soda all over your plants. White growth will appear on the upper and occasionally the lower sides of the leaves. It usually pops up on cucurbit families. So again, cucumbers, pumpkins, but it can affect most other vegetables. This is mainly a cosmetic disease. Um, it makes the plants look rather unsightly, but it doesn't really 
inhibit fruit production. So please don't panic if this pops up in your garden. If you do have a like a really high value plant that's had severe leaf loss from powdery mildew over several years, you may want to consider using a fungicide, but generally treatment isn't warranted. If you do um, look for fungicides containing DinoCap, mycobutanol or sulfur, you also can make up, this is kind of a DIY formulation of a fungicide for powdery mildew. Um, you want to mix about a tablespoon and a half of baking soda into three tablespoons of a horticultural oil. I think sun spray is probably the most popular. And then you mix that up into a gallon of water. And this has actually been shown to be really effective with powdery mildew control. This should be, and most other products should be applied about every seven to 14 days or until it's not quite so humid. Um, that usually tails off in late August, September. So that's once you start seeing the white growth. It won't help cure the white that's already on the leaves, but it'll help it from spreading onto new leaves. So how do you avoid problems with powdery mildew in the future? Try and reduce that humidity around your plants. This is pretty common with most disease control, but just increasing the airflow. Um, try not to overwater plants as this can increase the humidity around them. Try not to overhead water because it can splash um, fungal spores down onto other leaves. And finally, remove any infected plant debris at the end of the season. I will be drilling this into your heads until the end of the presentation, and then I might say it once more. Um, I see that I'm getting a few questions about the recipe. I'll repeat it one more time. Um, and then I believe this webinar will be recorded, correct, Jill? Yep, okay. Um, so it is one and a half tablespoons of baking soda into three tablespoons of a horticulture oil. The most common is sun spray, and then that gets mixed into a gallon of water. Okay. The next is common corn smut. This one's kind of a cool looking disease, um, or I think so. This can affect field pop and sweet corn. So it's kind of the corn trifecta. <laughs> um, this generally isn't a real significant disease except for in sweet corn it can just make it look very aesthetically unappealing and it makes it a little more difficult for canning or freezing so if you really want to process a lot of your corn um, you want to avoid getting this in your garden interestingly enough early stages of common corn smut are eaten eaten as a delicacy in some cultures and people try and cultivate it. This fungus leads to tumor-like galls on corn. They're filled with a sooty black powder. Eventually those galls will burst and explode, which is what causes it to spread. Generally, plants can get infected through unpollinated corn silk, so right when they are starting to form on the plant. But if there are wounds later in the season due to heavy wind, rain, or hail, um, it can get infected through there as well. Once those galls have formed, treatment's not possible. You can remove them, um, burn or bury, or dispose of those galls before they burst to prevent spores from spreading and overwintering in the soil. There aren't any fungicides that are labeled for control against common corn smut. Next, we move on to black rot. 
This is a disease that affects cruciferous vegetables, such as broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, kale, rutabaga, and turnip, as well as wild weeds in that family, such as wild mustard. This can be economically important to us in Outagamie County because we raise so much cabbage, especially in the Bear Creek area. So we want to just keep an eye on things. Black rot symptoms may not develop for more than a month after the vegetables have really started to take off and grown. So it's more of a mid to late summer disease. Initial symptoms that show up are irregular dull kind of yellow blotches that appear at the edge of the leaves. You might not even think that much of them because they just look like a little bit of discoloration. As things progress, the blotches expand into more of a V-shaped area with the widest part of that V at the edge of the leaf and the point towards where the leaf attaches to the base of the plant. Those yellow areas will probably become brown and dead in the center, but they will retain like a yellowish haloing around them. And sometimes it will be that the leaf almost becomes transparent and you can see the veins when you hold it up to the sun or light. Eventually it will get into the center of the plant and affect the vascular tissue, which is the water conducting tissue. And then it'll start to show signs of wilting. This is when it gets really bad. Um, and, you know, there's no saving your crop. Since it's caused by a bacteria, there's really no curative treatment, um, but proper fertilization can help aid things along and um, prevent it from happening. There's been some studies showing that lack of nitrogen um, can cause this disease to pop up just due to plant stress. So make sure you are getting proper nitrogen um, for your cruciferous plants, as well as just being really gentle with them. Try not to wound them at all, as this can serve as entry points for the bacteria. So Try not to break off a lot of leaves when planting or transplanting or handling. Also, do not overhead water. This can splash bacteria from plant to plant. If black rot does develop, especially severe black rot, remove all impacted plants, as well as any plants in the cruciferous family that are within a three to five foot radius of that impacted plant then dispose of these plants by burning, burying, or you can compost these. Okay, um, taking another little break for questions. Um, we have one in the Q&A that says, I read you can use water dump peroxide for blight. Any ideas? Also, aspirin and baking soda for strengthening or adding sweetness. Um, I have not heard of using water down peroxide for blight. I do know peroxide is like a really gentle form of bleach. So I can see where the thought process would come in with that. Um, but I don't know of any publications or research that's been done on that. Not to say that it's not out there, I'm just not familiar with it. Um, the aspirin and baking soda, I don't know if you're referring to adding sweetness to the soil um, or the plant. Um, but again, I haven't heard of that either. Okay, I don't see any other questions in the Q&A. Jill, are there any more in the chat? Um, no, thank you. Someone said that the one um, that you answered previously, they all, the neighbors all spray their lawns <laughs> trying to make a pollinator friendly thing in a little desert like that. <laughs> yeah, you can't control your neighbors. <laughs> Just do oh, your geez. best. 
<laughs> there is one. What about eggshells in the tomato garden for calcium? Yes, you can definitely use eggshells in the garden for calcium. It's usually something I recommend if you are seeing issues with blossom end rot. That's it. That's all I see. Okay, then we will continue on. The next. Yes, just, uh, there was a question. I don't see the question about sweetening. Um, but if I recall correctly, that's kind of an obsolete thing where sweetening the soil refers to controlling the pH. So you want, if your pH is too low, it's sour soil, mm -hmm. but that's what we have in this area. So it's, it's kind of an uh, archaic, pardon me, but expression that refers to the pH of the soil. That is true, Tom. And in most of Allegheny County, we have rather high pH. Um, a lot of times you'll see lime as being listed as a soil sweetener. Sometimes it even says it right on the, the bag for horticultural lime. But lime raises our pH. And in our area, we definitely don't want to do that. Um, most soil samples that I see come through, our pH hovers 7.9 to 8.1. Um, and ideally, most vegetable plants like it at about a 6.8 to 7.0. So we're quite a bit higher. If anything, I would recommend using an acidifying fertilizer and trying to bring that down a little bit. So thank you, Tom. Okay, we are going to move on to root crops. Um, the next one is potato scab. This is a really common disease of potatoes, but it can also affect other root vegetables. So anything that you are eating that comes directly out of the ground, such as beets, carrots, parsnips, um, radishes, rutabagas, turnips, Classic symptoms of scab include kind of a raised like corky rough patches on the root surfaces, as you can see in the photos. Eventually, if it gets bad enough, they can create large deep pits, which is kind of what you see on the photo on the right. Thankfully, <clears throat> you can still use the potatoes. They just don't look great. Thin-skinned varieties are most impacted, so a lot of times your early reds, they are uh, really susceptible to this. This is caused by a bacteria naturally found in our soils, so you can't really do much about it. Um, like I said, they just look bad. They still can be eaten. You just need to peel that scabby part off. Um, if you do want to store tubers that have been infected with this, um, just try and keep them in a cool, dark, dry place. Sometimes those scabby areas can be like a gateway for soft rot or other fungal diseases. So you just want to try and keep them as cool and dry as possible to reduce that. There are some varieties that have some resistance to potato scabs, such as Norlin, Russet Burbanks, and Superiors. These are pretty common. Um, you should be able to find them at garden centers throughout the beginning of the season. Try not to plant the potatoes in the same spot more frequently than once every three years in your garden. And try and rotate them around with things that aren't susceptible, such as corn peas, beans, any of the cucurbits. Um, also, there have been studies shown that drought impacted potatoes and other root crops are more susceptible to this. So make sure they are getting enough water when the tubers are forming. The next one we'll be covering is verticillium wilt. This is typically a fatal fungal disease that 
can impact a wide range of plants, including vegetable crops in Wisconsin. This also can impact ornamental, such as trees and shrubs. Um, it's just something in the soil. Initially in vegetable crops, you will see yellowing of foliage or modeling of foliage, such as down on the eggplant on the bottom picture. Usually it only appears on one side of the plant initially, which is kind of trademark of the disease. These leaves will then, after they yellow, will wilt and die. Oftentimes, they'll kind of mimic the natural aging process of leaves, so it can be hard to catch. Eventually, however, the entire plant wilts off, becomes affected, and dies. There is no cure for verticillium wilt. Um, the plants will eventually succumb to the fungal infection, but you generally can prolong the life of the plant with proper plant care. So making sure that it is getting enough water and proper fertilization. It just really, really stresses them out. But if you try and reduce that, you can prolong it and you might be able to get a crop off of it. To prevent verticillium problems in your garden, try and plant vegetable varieties that are resistant to verticillium wilt. In particular, there's a few tomato varieties that are resistant such as Big Beef or Beefy Boy. You might have heard of these or seen them at the garden center. If they are verticillium resistant, they will have a small V after their cultivar name on the tag. And I'll be going over that a little bit more at the end of the presentation. If these aren't available while you're shopping, um, look for varieties that mature early. For some reason, early maturing varieties are more likely to produce usable vegetables and not be impacted as severely by a verticillium wilt. Okay, another wilt, but this one is bacterial in nature. Um, lots of fun, all these wilts. So bacterial wilt generally can um, cause severe losses in cucurbits. So cucumbers, muskmelons, pumpkins, gourds, and other vining crops in that family. It is spread by the striped or spotted cucumber beetle as you see in the bottom right hand photo. The bacteria actually overwinters inside of the gut of that insect. So when these beetles feed on an infected plant, they pick up that bacteria and it stays inside of them. Then when they move on to new plants, they'll create that wound while they're feeding and the bacteria gets into the next plant system. It then multiplies really rapidly throughout the plant, plugs up that water conducting vascular tissue, and then this will result in wilting of the vines. Initially, you'll see that the leaves will be wilting during the day, but then they'll recover great at night. So you might not even think that anything's wrong, but eventually they'll turn yellow and brown at the margins and wither, die off. One way to confirm that it's bacterial wilt is to cut a vine off at the base of the plant. If it has a kind of slimy or gooey appearance to the plant stand, sap, then it's most likely bacterial wilt. You can see in the upper photo that that gooey plant sap can form strings between the two pieces of vine. So you'll want to look for that if you do think you have bacterial wilt. Once the bacteria gets in the plant, there's no way to control it. Um, the bacteria thankfully does not transmit into seed. It doesn't survive in the soil and it only survives in plant debris for a short period of time. The easiest way to control this is to manage those cucumber beetles because they are the number one carrier 
of this disease. If it does appear in just a few of your plants, remove them out of your garden as soon as possible, um, bury or dispose of them to prevent further spread of the disease. The next up is basal downy mildew. So generally herbs are pretty disease resistant, but basil is susceptible to this one main malady. Basil downy mildew has almost a similar look to powdery mildew, but only the undersides of the leaves are impacted. Thankfully, basil downy mildew only impacts basil. Symptoms typically develop first on lower leaves, um, and they actually first show up as leaf yellowing, which a lot of people think is due to a, like a nutrient deficiency. So they fertilize it. But when that doesn't work, they'll eventually turn brown. They will curl up, kind of look wilty. And then the undersides of the leaves will show up a grayish purple fuzzy material. Um, as you can see in the photo, there is no cure for basal downy mildew. If you do see it, you can harvest any asymptomatic leaves and any uninfected plants in your garden. Do it right away because this disease can spread fast. And then you'll want to use these herbs immediately. So it's a great excuse to like make some pesto. <laughs> um, to prevent this disease in the future, just keep plants well spaced and dried and avoid that overhead watering. In addition, the variety Eleonora has been bred um, and that does show some resistance to the disease. Sweet basil is generally the most impacted one by basil downy mildew. I believe that like the Thai basil um, and other other varieties, or not varieties, species of basil do have a little bit greater of a resistance. Okay, we're gonna take a quick short break for questions before moving on to some prevention techniques. Are there any that I have missed? Someone asked about Tums for calcium. I've heard of that. Um, it's not condoned by the university, which is where I get most of my information from. Um, but Tums do have a lot of calcium in them, I believe. So I can see where that thought process is coming from. Usually I recommend eggshells, lime, or bone meal. Those are my top three for a calcium provider. That's the only one I see. Okay. Then we will move on to prevention. So you've all heard your mother, grandmother say an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I know I've heard it a lot in my life. Well, it, it really is true in the gardening world. A lot of diseases can be controlled by good cultural practices in the garden. You've heard me mention a few during the presentation. Um, this includes watering properly and only when needed. In general, err on the side of dry if you're trying to prevent a lot of plant diseases than being too wet. Um, water in the morning, if possible. A lot of diseases like cool, moist environments. So by watering in the morning, you're giving the plants all day to dry off instead of being wet going into the cool nighttime hours. Try not to overhead water. I know some people turn on the sprinkler. I do myself occasionally. Um, but if you are having disease or bacterial problems, this can cause it to splash on two different plants and spread those diseases around. In general, most vegetables need about one inch of water per week. So a really easy way to track this is with a rain gauge being placed in your garden. Um, just helps keep an eye on how much rain we're receiving from mother nature and it can help prevent you from overwatering. In times of extreme temperatures, you will need to water more often though. 
Another thing that can help is spacing out your vegetables properly. This goes back to that cool, damp, humid environment. Proper spacing can aid in the airflow between plants and this can help that foliage dry off. Also, plants have better root space, which makes for a healthier plant. They're able to uptake more water and nutrients easier if they're spaced out a little bit. If you're wondering how far to space them, read the tags or the seed packets um, for suggestions on your differing plants. I know it's easy to overcrowd a garden when you buy your new little transplants at the garden center and they just look so small, but try not to plant them too close together. Next up is buying resistant varieties. Some vegetable varieties, like I've mentioned, have resistance um, bred into them. So you'll wanna look for a few key letters. This is especially important on tomatoes. So if you see a V, that's resistant to verticillium. F is fusarium. N is nematode resistance, which is a really small, small worm-like animal or organism, I guess would be a better word, um, that can impact rooting. We didn't cover that because it's in the insect category and we we're concentrating on diseases tonight, but um, a T is tobacco mosaic virus and A is anthracnose resistance. So just keep an eye, you'll see them after the varietal name on plant tags. Next is good fall cleanup. Um, I've touched on this again throughout the presentation, but removing that old debris from your garden, especially if you've had insect or disease problems, really helps reduce uh, the amount of pests and diseases that can overwinter in your soil. So if you leave it out there, there's a better chance it's going to overwinter. They'll crawl right back down in your soil once spring comes and then you'll plant your nice new plants in there and they're just sitting there waiting to attack them. So try and get all of that old debris out. Prevention continued. Um, last but not least, rotate your garden every year if you can. Um, I cannot emphasize this enough. This is part of that cultural care. Disease and insect problems tend to impact in plant families. So if things are overwintering in that garden, even if you clean up your debris, um, you don't want the same plant family in that area waiting to be attacked again. So if you had problems with blight last year on your tomatoes, you want to switch it up and plant something from a different family, such as cucumbers from cucumber. The, sorry, the cucurbit family. Um, sorry, I tripped over my word there. <laughs> um, a really easy way to do this is to keep a gardening journal. This should help you um, assist in your scheduled rotation. If you look at that infographic above, um, it kind of has the plant families outlined and that's available at that link up on the top. It's just a really great informative article about rotating your plant families in the garden. I know it's not always the easiest in small gardens, but it's really important if you try and do it. Touching back to that gardening journal, those are just a great idea in general. You can keep track of what did well, what kinds you planted, um, in addition to making a garden map of what you planted this year. Um, a few resources. The first one is the Plant Disease Diagnostics Clinic. I mentioned that in the beginning. They do testing on plant diseases all year round. So there is a small fee, but they will actually culture your plant if need be. They'll also examine it under a microscope. Um, and you can find more details about sending in plant samples there, you mail them in, um, or you can drop them off, but they're located in Madison. So unless you're in Madison, which there may be a few people joining us from there, I'm not sure, 
Um, mailing is generally your way to go. I've worked with Brian several, several times. He's very, very informational and knowledgeable. He's the one that runs the clinic down there. Underneath that is the Horticulture Extension website. They recently redid it and it is really, really great. There are publications and articles on just about anything you can think about for the horticulture world. Um, just a wealth of knowledge there. And then over on the right is my contact information. If you have problems with any of your plants during the season, please contact me or go on Gardener SOS with Tom and we'll work on it together. Um, but I would rather have you contact me than lose your whole crop because you weren't quite sure what was going on. Um, just an easy way, I will try and give you all the information that I can about what's in impacting your plants. So I believe that is all I have. Um, I think we have one more question about using coffee grounds as fertilizer. I have heard of that and I believe the background behind that is it can be acidifying and um, adding organic matter content to your garden, which is great, especially in our heavy clay. You want to make sure they are composted, though, to prevent any disease or insects that you may not know are hiding out in there. Actually, I think that coffee grounds would not raise your uh, soil pH. A lot of people think uh, coffee is acidic. But if it were acidic, it would taste sour. And if you've had coffee that's bitter, that means the pH is high. And it's also a nitrogen source. So you can put your coffee grounds in there unless you are truly an addict. Uh, I doubt that you'd be able to uh, add enough to make much of an impact at all. Thank you, Tom. We did have a late question coming in uh, asking, what do you recommend putting on lettuce and leafy greens? I have little black bugs eating holes in a lot of my lettuces. We didn't really cover bugs. <laughs> yeah, we were focusing a little bit more on diseases. Um, I would have to see what the bugs were to be able to make an accurate game plan to get rid of them or to recommend what to do with them. So if you do want to send me a photo of them, I will gladly take a look at them and we will get to the bottom of it. All right. Well, thank you very much, Caitlin. This was very, very informative. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Um, there's gonna be a garden tour on July 10th and another one on July 26th. The 10th, July 10th is on a Saturday. That's through the Upland Public Library. July 26th is a Monday night in July, and that's to the Kimberly Public Library. And um, Tom, did you want to give a little plug for Gardener SOS so people have more questions if they think of them afterwards? Yep, and anytime, just uh, send me an email to gardenersos at outagamey.org. And uh, we've got like 130 master gardeners in the county. So um, there's somebody that probably knows your answer. And if it uh, involves a disease, I'll probably go straight to Caitlin. So, and also I am setting up the programming for next year. So if you have the, any interest in topics, uh, send your suggestions to me and uh, we'll work on it. The past two, um, topics we've covered have come from suggestions from you. So Including send me your one. ideas. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Tom and Caitlin, for sharing your knowledge. And thank you all for coming. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you, Caitlin. Yeah, thank you.